Good morning and welcome to NorCal PTAC's webinar in partner, uh, partnership with the DCAA. Uh, that's the Defense Contract Audit Agency and, that it, and this is the DCAA overview and audit process. Next slide, please. Um, we, uh, my name is James Forrest. I'm a procurement specialist with NorCal PTAC. I'll talk a bit about PTAC in a second, but we're very thankful to have Joseph Greger here today, who is the Small Business Program Manager with the DC. AA. Um, so I'll just be sort of your MC. Joseph is going to give the uh, meat and potatoes of the presentation, so we're looking forward to that. Um, and I'll turn things over pretty quickly to Joseph, but first, like I mentioned, I just want to talk a little bit about who your hosts for today are. If we could hit the next slide here. NorCal PTAC, we are, uh, that's the Northern California Procurement Technical Assistance Center. And yes, it's a mouthful. That's why we like the acronyms here in government contracting. Helps keep some of the, the big Latinate words a little bit shorter. Um, but basically what we are, we are a nonprofit uh, center, part of a network of centers across the country. Um, and just if we, could, if we could minimize my video here so we can see the counties on the map there. Uh, thank you. Um, we are uh, basically part of a network of centers across the whole country. I think there's about 96, 97 of us in the whole nation. Uh, we get our funding from the Defense Logistics Agency as well as our governor's office and some other local uh, and state and local sources as well to keep our services running. We provide our services to anyone who has an established business in one of these 15 counties in Northern California you see on the map here and is looking to get assistance with government contracting specifically. So uh, we're, we're kind of similar. If you've heard of the Small Business Development Program, we're kind of sister programs to them, except we focus, we laser focus in on government contracting, whereas they help out with all sorts of things on, on a general level. Um, so basically what we do is we help our clients win government contracts. And so that could be if you're a newbie, if you're really just starting out in the government contracting world, um, or if you're an expert and you need some more help doing market research or dealing with compliance or how to close out, uh, things like that. So our one-on-one -on -one counseling is really the, the, the bread and butter of what we do. We have a team of procurement specialists, including myself, who if you apply and put in an application, we can assign you to procurement specialists. And you work with them uh, remotely via email, video conference, phone call, kind of whatever works out with the two of you. And then you go over the many processes of selling your goods and services to the government. So uh, if you've got a business that's been in the private sector for a few years, you want to expand in the government marketplace, well, you might need to get registered in SAM.gov. That's the system for award management. Uh, you might need to figure out how, which vendor portals you need to get into other than SAM. If you want to do a business in California, it's Cal eProcure. You want to find market research to see what's out there, what sort of solicitations uh, have been awarded to companies, uh, what's your competition look like, uh, what, where are the open bids? Uh, how do you actually put together a bid proposal? How to review that? How to, how to put together a capability statement? If you win an award, how to deal with compliance and issues like that? And even, um, as Joseph's going to talk about today, how to navigate the audit process. So we really do help with just about anything related with government contracting. Some things we don't help with, um, which are kind of adjacent. We don't help with business plans, even if it may be contracting is involved in your business plan. Um, you can work with the Small Business Development Center on getting a good business plan together um, that includes contracting and then come to us. Um, we don't help with financing or loans or startup assistance. So you should already be ready to go and have capacity when you come to us. And then we'd be uh, very thrilled to help you out with everything in between. So uh, we can set you up with a custom bid matching profile as well. This is a neat tool that we pay for. We offer to you for free. Basically what it does is it'll scour the whole internet, to look for things that you, uh, opportunities the, of, of government agencies trying to buy what you sell. So you'll work that out with your procurement specialist to put in some keywords, and then it'll find state, local, federal, uh, tribal, all kinds of different opportunities, RFQs, RFPs, sources sought, things like that out on the internet, and send them to your inbox every morning. So that's a really, really neat tool. Our clients get a lot out of it. And the third thing you know, because you're here today, we are putting on resources and trainings on a regular basis talk about some of our upcoming ones uh, later today, but you can find all of our upcoming events uh, all the time on our calendar at norcalptech.org. Click on the calendar button. And this, uh, this webinar today is actually going to be uploaded uh, to our internet website, 
under resources past webinars. So you can find that also on our website and that is conveniently also where you can apply to be a client. Click on the red apply now button and that's where the magic starts. In 2021 I'm alone, uh, we helped our clients win more than a half of a billion, would it be a billion dollars? And that's mostly uh, going into the uh, pockets of small businesses in our service area. So we're really proud of that figure and what we do uh, to help out businesses in our area. And if you're in our area, we'd love to hear from you. If you're not in our area, you can click on that second link where you get the slides today, uh, aptac-us.org slash find a PTAC. That will get you a directory of all the PTACs in the country. You can find yours. I also find that just typing in the name of my county and the state uh, and followed by the word PTAC usually comes up with the correct resource. So however you want to do it, you can wait for the slides or just go do your research, do your research right now. On these slides, you have our phone number. That's the front office and our main info uh, email address. Feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. All right, let's go ahead and hit the next slide here and we're gonna hand things over. Uh, just, a, just a recap of housekeeping. Um, please, any questions, you can put them in the Q&A. Uh, chat you can you can uh, you can use to network and everyone's going to get a recording of this later today. So uh, let's go ahead and hand things over to Joseph. Joseph Greger is the small business program manager with the Defense Contract Audit Agency, otherwise known as the DCAA for short. I know, like I said, we love our acronyms here. So uh, you're in excellent hands with Joseph. Um, if you have any questions about this, please enter them in the Q and A into the Q and A, and uh, Joseph will take care of you. So thanks so much, Joseph. We appreciate your partnership on this. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, James. I appreciate that. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending. I, I appreciate uh, being here. I, I think this is actually my first uh, training event uh, with NorCal PTAC, and I do appreciate that. I, I work with uh, many of the PTAC locations all over the country. So, uh, you know, I consider uh, PTAC's a, a very close friend, uh, considering what I do and in, in, in my position with the, within the agency. So just to provide a little bit of background about myself, um, you know, like James said, I'm the small business program manager for DCAA. Uh, you know, in this capacity, I serve as the program manager and audit expert for the small business program. And basically what it comes down to is just really helping small businesses understand and navigate the, all the various requirements uh, the, the, that are important to them and uh, so, so that you can become successful uh, in terms of federal contracting, uh, before before uh, before this position or before I was the small business program manager, I was a branch manager at a local office uh, here in Northern Virginia. I actually live and reside in Northern Virginia. Uh, actually, I'm 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 really close to uh, our headquarters, which is Fort Belvoir, Virginia. Uh, and so I do have some uh, I do have some small uh, branch manager experience. Uh, I, I had an office of about 35 to 40 uh, auditors, and we actually audited a lot of small small companies, uh, such as yourself. So I have that experience. And then prior to that, I was a supervisor. And then when I first started with the agency, I was an auditor. So that was uh, kind of a very traditional tra tra trajectory, if you will, uh, with within DCAA. So. So now you know a little bit about, about myself, let me go ahead and move on into uh, the really the meat and potatoes of today's uh, presentation. Uh, there'll be two parts. Okay, the first is gonna be an intro uh, introduction and DCAA overview. And then we'll talk about the audit process uh, a, little, a little bit later on, okay. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about the intro and overview. I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna slide the camera off screen uh, just, just so that it doesn't interfere with uh, the, the slide deck, um, uh, and then I'll just come back on uh, at the end for, for questions, okay? All right, so let's talk about DCAA. Let's, um, you know, it's important to understand. So, so first of all, I, I don't know how much, I don't know how many of you out there have heard of DCAA. Uh, you know, maybe you've heard of us, maybe you haven't, but, you know, I think it's really important to understand where we came from, and that gives you some idea of sort of where we're at now uh, and where we're going and, and sort of our, our function and our role within the procurement process, right? So, you know, prior to 1965, the function of contract audit was actually performed by the various military services, okay? In 1964, the Secretary of Defense decided that the function of contract audit, uh, you know, would be performed more efficiently and effectively uh, if it was under 
a single, you know, single audit organization. And so that's basically where DCA came from. Uh, you know, we were established in 1965 uh, by transferring all of the existing functions from each of the military services into a single contract audit agency. Okay. Uh, and so we are the audit organization, the audit agency for DOD. All right. There's, there's, there's no other agency that does what we do. In fact, you know, outside of DOD, we're really the only audit agency that does what we do as well. And so we actually, you know, perform a lot of audit services for non-DOD as well, right? Uh, we have oversight of about 9,000 contractors every year. We average more than 3,400 audit reports, and we examine more than $350 billion of contract costs. So we actually have a pretty big reach for being sort of a, a medium-sized agency, right? Okay, so next slide. This is our mission here. Uh, as you can see, it says, together with our acquisition partners, we increase warfighter capabilities by delivering high quality audits and financial services to achieve fair and reasonable prices that protect taxpayer dollars. And, and again, that's important because this is really critical to our, to our mission. This is, really, uh, this is really kind of our role within the procurement process is to help uh, those procurement offices so that they can make uh, good procurement decisions uh, that ultimately saves taxpayer dollars. That's really that's really our that's really the value that we bring to this process is to perform perform those audits, and we want to make sure that the government gets the best value for the uh, for the for the dollar for every dollar that's being spent. Okay, uh, I'm on the moving on to the next slide. You know, if we look at DCA as a whole, we have about 4,600 employees. Uh, we have over 300 offices throughout the U.S. and also overseas, primarily here in the U.S., okay? And I mentioned earlier that we, mainly because we are a DOD organization, we perform audits for DOD, but we also uh, perform uh, audits and other services to non-DOD as well. So if you're a small business out there and if you have contracts with, let's say, NASA or Department of Energy, you know, there, there could be a chance, right, albeit small, but there could be a chance that DCA can audit your books and records, right? So that's, I think that's something just to be aware of. Now, if we look at, if we look at the uh, Department of Defense organization overall, and as you can see, DCAA fits within DOD. We operate under the authority, direction, and control of the Undersecretary of Defense Comptroller. This placement assures our independence from offices that have procurement responsibility. Okay, for, for example, as you can see, Army, Navy, Air Force, and then also DCMA. Those are generally the offices that have procurement responsibility. And so this independence, this organizational independence is crucial uh, because of our auditing standards that we must comply with, right? Every audit we perform must be in compliance with what's called generally accepted government auditing standards. And one of the many standards we must follow is independence. So we, we have what's called organizational independence. And this, like I said, this is important because this really lends credibility and objectivity and, and, and we wanna remove bias as much as we can from our audit work, okay? So now moving on, this is our next slide here. This is just an overview of DCAA's organization. I won't really get into this a whole lot, but I will note that we have a new director of DCAA. Uh, her name is Miss Terry Dilly. Okay, and then my role as the small business program manager, I fall within what's called operations, which is a part of headquarters. Now, as a small business, I think what's important to know what's important to note about our organizational structure it, are the regions, uh, are you know the three regions that we have. We have Eastern, Central, and Western. Uh, field detachment technically isn't a region. Uh, it's generally just a group of auditors that primarily audit contracts that have uh, that are classified. So if you're a small business and you know let's say the preponderance of your work is classified, then you would be you would be audited by auditors within what's called field detachment. okay So that's just you know that's just that's something to be aware of. But I did want to focus in on the regions because that's important. Right. You know, a lot of small businesses have the need or are required to know who their cognizant DCAA office is. And so 
Uh, first, you know, it's important to understand what region you fall under, and then I'll talk about how, you know, how I'll talk about, you know, how should I, how do you go about finding your office, right? So if you look at this map here, the map is sort of shown by the by the three regions that we have, and I'm sure you can kind of tell by the color uh, and the geography where those boundaries, you know, lie. So of course, the western region is is probably the largest region, as you can see. And obviously, if you're a small business, anywhere within that area, that green area, you will fall under the Western region. The orange is central. And then, of course, uh, along the East Coast is the Eastern region. OK, now, again, that's important because that's important because, you know, many times. If you're submitting your your package, if you're submitting your bid against a, a government's RFP, a lot of times the contracting officer will want to know your Cognizant DCAA office, okay? So we have a, a function on our website. If you, if, you, if you have the need to find out who your office is, uh, you can go to our website, www.dca.mil. Within the locator tab, you can click on US CONUS. And then here, I would just recommend searching by your cage code, okay? Every, every contractor, uh, has a cage code, or I should say, if you're registered in SAMS, you should have a cage code. Okay, and this would probably be your best best way to find out who your office would be. Okay, if not, if you can't find your office for whatever reason, just just contact me, and and I can provide that information. Okay. Now, I do want to talk quickly about some of the audit services that we provide, and this is typically broken out by the contract timeline. So if we think about the contract in three phases, we have the pre-award stage, typically, you know, meaning pre, uh, pre-contract award. Then we have contract performance. Another term is just post-award. And then we have contract closeout, okay? Now, again, as a small business, uh, uh, DCA generally is involved with small businesses upfront in the pre-award stage. Okay, and so some of the audits that you typically might see from DCA would be a price proposal audit, a pre-award accounting system audit, and then in some cases we could do what's called a cost realism or a forward pricing, uh, a forward pricing rate proposal audit. Okay, so those forward pricing, that's less common for, for a lot of small businesses, but we have done them in the past. Now, during the contract performance, or again, another way of saying that, post-award, we have, as you can see, a number of audits that we can perform. You know, for small businesses, again, I think the most common or the ones that you would typically see would be the incur cost audit. Okay. And I would also maybe argue that, uh, that we might perform what's called real-time labor evaluations. Okay. Where we come in, we perform employee interviews, right? We, 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 we conduct interviews with employees you know, and, and we kind of talk to them about their timesheets, you know, we ask them if they're aware of the timekeeping policies within the company, and so on and so forth. Okay, one, one thing to note as a small business, you are exempt from cost accounting standards. So as a result, uh, DCA will never perform a CAS disclosure statement audit or a CAS compliance audit on a small business. So that's, you know, that's a good thing. <laughs> Because those audits can be very long and, be, and very complex, uh, and then at con and then at the contract closeout, uh, you know, honestly, DCA doesn't really perform a lot at, at, at that stage, primarily because the ACO it's it's a very administrative uh, process. But sometimes we're asked to perform uh, some services. One example might be the final voucher review. In other certain circumstances, if conditions apply we may perform what's called a termination audit, okay? All right, so now let me move on and let me talk uh, in a little bit more detail about some of the audits that you may see from DCAA, okay? And so the purpose of this is really just to kind of give you some background, some context, uh, or at the very least, just provide some awareness so that should you be in a situation or a position, uh, where DCA comes out and performs an audit, you, you have some, you know, some understanding or at least some awareness of, of what we're doing and why we're doing it, you know, that kind of thing. So like I said, the accounting system audit is probably one of the most common 
Okay, and the purpose of this is, is for DCA to review your accounting system, your policies and procedures, you know, to make sure that your, the system itself, right, the accounting system itself, your policies and procedures are adequate for uh, accumulating costs, allocating costs on, on government contracts, okay? And there's actually specific uh, accounting requirements there. As you can see, it's DFARS 252.242-7006. So this applies to any DOD contract that is cost reimbursable, okay? So just, so, so that's really, that's really the, the trigger for the accounting system requirements is any cost reimbursable contract uh, any DOD cost reimbursable contract, right? The DFARS, the accounting system clause will be applicable for any DOD cost reimbursable contract, right? So just understand that, be aware of that. Like I said, if you're being, you know, if you're, let's say, yeah, in the process of, of negotiating with the government and they're, and they plan on awarding you a DOD cost reimbursable type contract, well then just understand your accounting system must comply with these, with these, with these criteria, right? So that, so that's just food for thought, you know. Uh, or you know, you might be in a position where you know maybe you're working to get into that, uh, into that position. So maybe you know later down later this year, maybe next year, you plan on getting awarded cost reimbursable contracts. But if you understand what those requirements are, then I think you might be in a position now, right? You, you know, you can kind of work now so that when you're in that position and when you get audited, you know, you have everything, everything in place. Okay. Now let me, let me go over some frequently asked questions related to the accounting system. I, I do get these quite a bit, you know, many small businesses are wondering, Hey, can I request DCA to audit my accounting system? Unfortunately, the answer to that question is no. Uh, DCA does not respond to contractor requests. Okay. So we only respond to uh, contracting officers or any federal entity that has procurement responsibility, right? Like I said before, that is our role within this whole procurement process is that we uh, we help and support the procurement community, okay? Uh, how do I get a DCA approved account, a government accounting system? Well, that's a little bit of a trick question because there is no such thing as a DCA approved government accounting system. Okay, again, what, what DCA does is we perform an audit of your accounting system and we make sure that it complies with certain requirements. That's, that's, that's really all that we do. And then, you know, like I said, it's really up to the contracting officer to then make a determination on whether your system is adequate or inadequate. Okay, so that's, that's really what, what, what the process is. Okay, and then you know, this final question, I get this quite a bit as well. A lot of businesses will ask, you know, hey, does, you know, and you can really insert any, any software. It doesn't have to be QuickBooks, but, you know, they'll ask, hey, does, you know, insert name of software, uh, is it acceptable for account uh, for federal contracting? And, you know, my, my response to, to that is, you know, the accounting software itself, the, 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 the actual software, uh, you know, isn't your accounting system. Okay. So, you know, what I tell people is, you know, make sure you have policies and procedures in place. Okay. And also you want to make sure that you have the right, uh, the right people in place, right? You have the knowledge, you have the expertise. Okay. If you don't have the right people, then you can have, you can have the most expensive software out there, but if you don't have, if you don't have the right people, if they don't have an understanding of, of cost principles and all the, 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 the FAR and the DFARs, then it doesn't really matter what software you're using because, you know, a lot of this comes down to the policies and procedures and then also having the right people in place. Okay. So these are just some things that you want to think about when it comes to your accounting system. Let me move on to proposal adequacy. And, you know, again, this is another audit that you might see from DCAA or another audit that we that we could perform. And again, at the request of the contracting officer, okay? And the purpose of this is to review your cost estimates, right? We wanna make sure that your cost estimates are fair and reasonable so that the government, you know, we, the government wants to make sure 
that whatever product or service that they're getting, they're getting a fair and reasonable price for it, right? That's the idea behind, behind this. The trigger or threshold for this audit is typically uh, $10 million if it's a fixed price, fi a fixed price award or $100 million cost reimbursable award. So those are the two thresholds, okay? And, you know, one of the things you can, one of the things about this is, you know, the, the important part about this is, do you have adequate cost or pricing data, right? So the key to this is, you know, contractors really should have good underlying data that supports their cost estimate. So if you, if you think your labor, if your labor estimate is, Fifty dollars an hour. Well, what are your, you know, what underlying data, what cost or pricing data that you have, do you have that justifies that fifty dollars an hour? That is the key to all this, and that's what, you know, that's really what DCA is going to be looking for. Okay. All right. Uh, and again, like it, if we're talking about your cost proposals, you want to make sure you have cost or pricing data that supports all your proposed costs. You also want to make sure you have adequate budgetary data, right? So not only direct, you have you know, you have your cost estimates for your direct costs, but you also want to make sure you estimate your indirects as well. Indirect expenses is a large part of any of any cost proposal. And then if applicable, you want to make sure you have adequate contract analysis. Okay. Now, the final one here I'll just talk quickly about is, is what's called an incur cost proposal. Okay. And the purpose of this is really for contractors to uh, really put together all of their actual costs that they've incurred for that fiscal year. Okay, and the trigger for this is going to be uh, any cost reimbursable contract. Okay, because any cost reimbursable contract will automatically have what's called the allowable cost and payment clause. Uh, and that is the clause that requires contractors to submit uh, an annual incur cost proposal. Okay, and the requirement is six months after the close of your, of your uh, fiscal period. Okay, uh, and so some of you out there might, might have heard. Uh, the uh, the incur cost audit that's probably one of the most common or maybe one of the most notable audits that DCA performs. Okay, and um, you know, and what get and 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 the the FAR requirement that gives DCA authority for this is thirty one two one two D, which says contractors must maintain records and supporting documentation uh, to demonstrate allowability and allocability of costs. Right. So when we perform the audit, you know, we're going to ask you, hey, what what documents do you have? What supporting documents do you have that demonstrates these costs are allowable and allocable? Okay. Now, with with the incurred costs, you know, a lot of people talk about what's called the ICE model. The ICE model is something that DCA has developed uh, over the years, and the and and the intent of that is to help small businesses uh, with the preparation of their incurred cost proposal. So I would rec I would check that out. That's actually on our public website. So if you have time. Uh, you know, I would definitely check that out. And then uh, another feature that we have as well is, is, is what's called the, the contractor submission portal. So if you want to submit your anchor cost pro proposal, you can do that through the contractor submission portal or kind of the old fashioned way, mo the way that most contractors do it is to just submit it directly to the DCA office, right? So you can either, you can use either method but we do recommend using the contractor submission portal. Okay. All right. Now let's move on to our next uh, topic here and talk about the audit process. Right. So I, I spoke, you know, about some of the audits that we can perform the accounting system, the proposal, the anchor costs. So those are all different kinds of audits, right? This uh, presentation here, we'll talk about uh, some of the common you know, touch points or milestones that you'll see in every audit, right? So if you're going through an audit or if you anticipate on going through an audit, these are some of the things that you that you should see during the audit process, right? Every audit will be different in terms of the timeline, in terms of, you know, the specific information that they may ask, in terms of the criteria that we look at, but there is a typically a process, a standardized process, and a standardized framework for which we perform the audit. And that's, and my goal is to really kind of go over that with you. So you have sort of that understanding. So uh, again, like I said, if you're going to go through an audit, or if you anticipate on going through an audit, you you'll sort of understand or have some understanding 
of what to expect during the audit. Okay. So as you can see, we'll talk about the adequacy review. Okay, communication is really the key during during any audit, whether it's uh, a DCAA audit, whether it's you know if you have you know tax ta tax auditors coming in, whether you have financial auditors coming in, right? Communication is very important. It's important. It, it is important to us as well, and I'll talk about that uh, very shortly. And then we'll also discuss things like site visits and also requests for information. Okay. Now the start of any, the start of any audit will begin will begin with what's called an adequacy review, okay. And this is where the auditor will perform an evaluation of a contractor's assertion uh, to make sure that it's adequate, okay. Now the term assertion that's sort of a technical term that that's a term that we use internally. Uh, it's sort of an audit term, but basically the assertion. Is, is the thing, and I'm using quotes, and you may not see me, but the assertion is the thing that DCA is auditing. And that thing could be anything. It could be your incur cost submission, right? It could be your forward pricing proposal. It could be your, um, uh, it could be your uh, cost, cost price proposal, right? It could be the accounting system assertion, right? So it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily matter what the assertion is, but uh, just understand the start of every audit begins with an adequacy review of the assertion. Okay. Now, once we perform that, we'll, we'll, we'll sort of contact you. Okay. To set up what's called an entrance conference. And the entrance conference is with the contractors designated representatives. Okay. And this is something that we, and this is something that we perform at the start of every, uh, of every audit. Okay. Uh, and really the goal of this is to, uh, you know, obviously we meet with the contractor personnel, we sort of start building that bridge, right? Start developing a, a working relationship, but also we want to make sure that you understand the purpose of the audit. Okay. We'll explain to you the purpose of the audit, you know, what's the basis of the audit? Why, why are we performing the audit? Okay. We can also talk about the overall plan, you know, for how we, we will conduct the audit. We might also provide timelines, okay? So for example, you know, we anticipate on performing uh, the field work at this date. We anticipate on issuing the report on this date, you know, et cetera, et cetera, okay? The other aspect of the entrance conferences is also talking about the types of books and records, okay? And other data that the auditor may, 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 may request, right? So, so, so those are, at a high level, those are some of the things you can expect during an entrance conference. And obviously this is, you know, this is not a one-sided conversation, right? We do encourage contractors to ask questions, um, you know, ask questions if there's something you don't understand or if you're not clear about, please, you know, we wanna have this, this discussion uh, because it's better to sort of, you know, it's better to work those things out in the beginning versus later on down the road during the middle of the audit or even at the end of the audit, uh, if there was something that you weren't clear about, um, you know, we, we, would, we, want, we want to make sure that you're, you know, that you have a full understanding of what we're doing and why we're doing it. Okay. We also may discuss uh, working arrangements. Uh, I know, you know, I realize we're sort of still in this kind of COVID environment where a lot of people are still working from home, but, um, but, you know, just, just understand, um, there may be times where the audit team would need to come out to your workspace uh, or your office space to review documents or to even talk to some of your personnel. So those, so those kinds of things will be sort of discussed in the entrance conference. And again, every entrance conference will be slightly different, right? Because uh, every contractor is different. Your situations all might be different. So, but these are some general things that you, that you should expect really in, in any entrance conference, okay? Now, once we go, once we get through the entrance conference, the next step is called a walkthrough. Okay, in some cases, the entrance conference and walkthrough are really the same thing, but the walkthrough really is more focused, and it's going to be a discussion surrounding the assertion itself. Right. So remember, I I, I talked about the assertion. So whether it's the proposal, whether it's an incur cost proposal whether it's your policies and procedures, whether it is your 
you know, let's say for a pricing rate proposal. So whatever that assertion is, whatever subject of audit we're, 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 we're dealing with, okay, that is really going to be the main focal point of the walkthrough. Okay, so, you know, generally that entails the auditor or the audit staff talking with you or the person or team that developed that, that assertion, right? So if you had a team, let's say you had a team of two or three people that developed the incur cost submission, then it probably makes sense to have those individuals uh, talking to our auditors during the walkthrough, okay? Whereas the answers conference typically involves, you know, everyone to include some of the higher level folks, like, you know, let's say management, right? Your, your owner, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Now let's talk about the notification letter. So no, the notification letter, really, this is a requirement. This is just a letter that we send to the contractor communicating certain information. So the information really, really what this is, is just a written documentation of the entrance conference. That's really what the notification letter is. Okay, so I won't really get into that a whole lot, but just understand, uh, you know, that you'll get a letter from us. And by the way, I should also mention this, a lot of what we're talking about here, this is all, this is all a requirement, the entrance, the walkthrough, entrance, the notification letter, these are all requirements for our, our, our auditing standards, right? So like I mentioned before, we have uh, auditing standards that we must comply with when we perform an audit, and there are certain things that we must do. And a lot of this uh, is in line with those auditing standards, okay? Now let's uh, keep moving on and let me talk about interim discussions. So really, you know, after the entrance conference, after the walkthrough, you know, we send you the notification letter. At that point, we're, uh, you know, we're really ready to, to start the, um, to start the field work, uh, the, the field work of the, of the audit portion, right? And so during the field work, this is where we have a lot of that back and forth communication, right? So, you know, again, throughout the audit, the auditor uh, would discuss matters with the contractor and request additional support as necessary to obtain a full understanding of the subject audit. So this is where, this is, like I said before, this is really where we have that communication. You know, it should be frequent and it should be often. And it's really, uh, you know, and it should not be a one-sided type of discussion. It really should be a conversation with all relevant parties to include DCAA, but also uh, the contractor as well. So that's really important uh, to understand, you know, and we welcome that, right? We, we, we really, um, you know, we do encourage that. Uh, so the exit conference, so this is really at the completion of the field work. So this is, you know, towards the end of the audit, uh, you know, very similar to the entrance conference, right? The exit conference is where, uh, you know, we hold a, a meeting with the contractor's uh, representatives, and to discuss the audit results and obtain the contractor's views concerning any findings or conclusions and recommendations. Again, you know, like I mentioned just, just a minute ago, you know, we wanna have continuous and frequent conversations throughout the audit, okay? To also include uh, findings, uh, to include findings, right? So if we have findings, if we have negative findings during the audit, we will communicate that to the contractor during the audit. So when we get to the exit conference, everything that we discuss in the exit conference should be things that you know the contractor should uh, should be aware of. Okay, so I don't want you to think that you know DCA comes in and performs an audit, and then six months later we tell you, oh hey, we found all these issues. Uh, that should not be the case. Okay, and if it is, then then um, you know, let me know, and and we can talk about those uh, separately. But that that really shouldn't be the case. Okay. A couple of things with the exit conference that you know could be relevant to you. You know, sometimes we ask the contacting officer to attend uh, the ex exit conference. I know in many cases, if it's a very large or high profile audit, uh, in many cases, and uh, the contacting officer may attend the exit exit conference. But, you know, in my experience with a lot of small businesses, especially if there's no findings, then it's typically just a very casual, you know, uh, sometimes it's even a phone call. But even if it's a face-to-face -face meeting, it's just the auditor 
the supervisor and usually one or two contractor reps there. So it's, it's in many cases, it's not a very formal process, but it's still something that we must, we must perform. Okay, let me talk quickly about some of the audit opinions. So of course, we're an audit agency, we perform audits and our, our end product, if you will, is an audit report with an audit opinion, right? That is really, that is really what we're producing is an audit opinion. So, you know, let me talk about the different opinions that we can issue. There's four of them, okay? And I'll kind of go from best to worst, right? If you kind of think about it in that, in that sense, right? The best audit opinion is an unqualified opinion, okay? And essentially what this says is, you know, the contractor's assertion, right, again, what we're aud the the thing that we're auditing, the assertion itself, right? We we didn't find any any reportable issues. Okay. So that's an unqualified opinion, otherwise known as a clean opinion, right? So that's the best. Or I should say that's the most desirable, uh, at least from the contractor's perspective, that's the most desirable. A qualified opinion, okay, a qualified opinion essentially means we performed an audit on the contractor's assertion again whatever the thing under audit and we did not find any issues except for this over here except for this one thing right so uh you know an example could be let's say we audited your you know 50 million dollar incur cost proposal and everything looked fine except for this one thing over here we found, let's say we found, you know, $1,000 of unallowable expenses. Okay, let's say it was alcohol expense, right? Uh, in that scenario, we would issue a qualif qualified opinion and say everything was fine except for this one thing, okay? The next opinion we could issue is called an adverse. And what this says is, and, and I'm sure you can kind of see the trend here, okay, because we're slowly building, right? You know, in the first situation, we didn't find anything. In the next opinion, we found a little bit, right? Adverse, we, 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 you know, we have a lot more issues, right? So the adverse opinion basically says, you know, we, perform, we performed an audit and, you know, we have significant, we have significant uh, instances of where, you know, there are question costs or, we, or you know, there are, you know, uh, non-compliances right but the idea here is that there's pervasive right because there's a lot of them and it's and it's and it's significant right so the you know maybe a large dollar amount or maybe uh in er each of the areas that we're reviewing we found a lot of issues okay the last opinion and this is by far the worst is called a disclaimer uh this is no opinion at all meaning dcaa does not have an opinion because uh, we were unable to perform an audit sufficient in scope to enable the auditor to form an opinion, okay? So I don't see this a whole lot. This is, I would say, fairly unusual. Uh, one example could be, and this actually happened to me, the contractor, um, the contractor, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, supporting documentation uh the contractor kept in a warehouse right the warehouse was managed by a third party and there was a there was a flood right at, at the warehouse and so a lot of the documents were destroyed in the flood so when dca came in when we came in to try to perform the audit we were asking the contractor hey provide us the supporting documentation but they they were unable to because a lot of that data like i said it was it was destroyed in the warehouse so that's a situation where DCAA, you know, we couldn't perform the sufficient, the audit, uh, we couldn't perform the audit in a, in a sufficient manner to even give us some understanding of whether those costs were allowable. So we couldn't provide an opinion. Okay, so that's an, could be an example of a disclaimer. Like I said, I don't really see that a whole lot. Okay, uh, site visits, like I mentioned before, during the entrance conference, the, the, the auditor would, uh, in many cases, might coordinate different site visits, you know, for us to come out during the field work, review documentations, 
maybe even talk to some of your accounting personnel or whoever the the appropriate people would be, right? So that's so that's something to be aware of. Okay. The other common, um, you know, most audits will also include what's called a request for information. Okay, so this is generally written or it could be oral, but it's a request to contractors to provide cost or pricing data or other supporting documentation uh, for the audit itself. Okay. And a couple of expectations for that, I think it's good to know. Uh, for contractors that, you know, when you provide the information, we ask that you provide electronic information when available. Obviously, you want to provide a timely response and communicate to us any delays. It's also important that you ask for clarification. So if you're not sure what we're asking or why we're asking it, please reach out to us, ask for clarification, and we'll be happy to, um, to, to, to you know, we'll be happy to discuss uh, that with you. And then also when you give us the information, you know, make sure it's in a kind of organized fashion. So, you know, one, one method typically would be, you know, contractors provide all the supporting documentation for a specific uh, request. So the request generally will be uh, numbered some way. So maybe request, you know, one, request two, request three. And so if you're submitting documents for request number three, you know, you could provide all the documents together for that for that one request, right? So that's an example, but you know, the idea is it has to be in an organized, uh, in an organized fashion. Okay. Okay. Uh, we're getting towards the end here. Um, so I do have some frequently asked questions. Uh, what triggers a DCAA audit? Okay. And basically, uh, there really isn't a straightforward answer to this, but generally, is going to be uh, one of two things, right? So if you think about it, the rights of the government to perform an audit are established by the terms and regulations incorporated into your agreement. So that's really the first uh, trigger is going to be, what are the terms and conditions of, of, of your agreement? Uh, some, some regulations require an audit, right? So for example, like I mentioned the, the, the incur cost, Okay, that is triggered by the allowable cost of payment clause. And if you take a look at that clause, it actually requires uh, uh, DCAA to perform an audit or it, uh, well, essentially what it requires is the government to settle your final indirect rates, whether they do it themselves or they do it through assistance with, with an auditor, which is DCAA, okay? The other part of this is uh, DCA audits are generally triggered by a contracting officer or ACO's need for audit service to make uh, procurement decisions. So uh, an, uh, an example of this would be the accounting system. So again, if the government is awarding a cost type contract, then the contracting officer is required to make sure that they have an adequate accounting system. They can do that uh, uh, it, you know, the, they can do that if they have information available. If not, they can do that through they can do that through DCA by requesting the audit. Okay. Uh, how do I request DCA audit? You know, I, I think I addressed this earlier, but but you know, DC, uh, DCA does not perform audits requested by the contractor. We only perform audits based on a request or established need from a federal entity. Okay. How long, is this, how long does a DCA audit take? Well, again, this is hard to say, but every audit uh, will have a different timeline and it's based on many factors. Uh, every audit, um, you know, DCA will perform what's called a risk assessment in every audit. And the purpose of that is to determine the scope of the audit. So factors such as, uh, you know, the risk, the materiality, and even the willingness of the contract to support the audit all play a part in you know, in terms of how long the audit takes, okay? All right, so we're getting near near the end here. I do, I do wanna point out some small business presentations that we have available on our public website. So as you can see here, um, all these presentations are available. So if you're interested in more about, let's say the accounting system, then by all means, please visit the website. You can get a copy of the presentation, okay? As well as the, some other topics, topics as you can see here. Okay, uh, uh, we have some other resources for you guys as well. 
Okay, we have uh, a lot of guidance. We have a lot of checklists and tools. You know, one thing I'll mention is, you know, I talked about the audit process, but one thing that contractors could also do is, you know, look at the directory of audit program. Okay, so the audit program is really, that's, that's, that's the game plan for how DCA will plan to perform the audit. So that's available out there on the public website. And so if you get a copy of that, then you will have an understanding of, of, of every audit that we perform. You'll know the purpose of the audit, why we perform the audit, you'll know the criteria. You'll even know the audit steps and the types of information that we're, that we're looking for. So that's, I think that's a very, uh, I think that's a, that's a very valuable resource. All right. I do want to encourage you to check out the website because we do have a new small business tab, as you can see on the far right. It consolidates all the information that I that I talked about into one into one section. Uh, this is my contact information here. So again, by all means, reach out to me. Should you have questions, you can email or or give me a call. Uh, I'm here to help. Okay. Great. Thank right, you I so think much. That's it for me. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Joseph. Uh, that is the main presentation. We do have a little bit of time for questions. Just want to let everyone know, uh, we'll just highlight one upcoming event we're having on December 1st. Um, if you're already in the deep dive on uh, government contracting, then join us for cybersecurity government regulations. There's a lot of changes that are going on in that world as well, which Joseph may also have some insight on. Um, but we are we have a cybersecurity expert lined up to give the main presentation. So. We're looking forward to that as well. That's on Thursday, December 1st, 10 a.m. Pacific, same time as today, just in a couple weeks. So we hope you, you'll join us for that. And let's go ahead and head to the next slide. Um, any questions? So we do have one question here already from Tim. Um, Tim is saying, you mentioned that small businesses are exempt from CAS below a certain contract value. However, there are a broad level of exemptions. Is there a single source of info on the exemptions and thresholds? Uh, unfortunately, there isn't. <laughs> yeah, there isn't. Uh, there isn't one consolidated place where you can go to find out, you know, all what those are for small businesses. So, unfortunately, it's you know, and and one of the reasons is because there's so much information out there. You know, there's different regular regulatory bodies, right? So, you, not only FAR and DFARS, but Many other uh, government agencies uh, have their own supplement to FAR. So, you know, those might have specific things that might, um, uh, that might, uh, you know, that, that might apply, that may or may not apply to small businesses, right? You also have DPC, which is Defense Pricing and Contracting, which is part of DOD that also puts out high level policy. So, so to answer your question, no, there isn't one consolidated place. Uh, it's, I think it's a matter of just, knowing where to look and just trying to find what you can and um, and just trying to put it together. And so I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, my, my position it, position exists to for that for that same reason, right? It's to help small businesses um, with those kinds of questions and I can certainly help uh, where I can, so. All right, thanks. That's a good question, Tim, and it's a good answer. Um, all right, any other questions? I don't see any questions in the chat, the Q&A. So let's go ahead and give you a couple minutes back of your day and just give a hearty thanks to Joseph. If you're leaving, you'll be redirected towards the survey. Um, if you could just take a couple minutes, uh, or really just a minute to fill that out and let us... <coughs> Oop, that one Bless came you. out of left field. It came right out of left field there. I was not expecting that to sneeze. Um, if you could just let us know what you thought of today's webinar, we love to improve our webinars constantly and it's a valuable information for us. So. Um, Let's give uh, a big thanks here to Joseph for partnering with us and putting on uh, this presentation today. So thanks so much, Joseph. And thanks, everyone, for coming. My pleasure. All right. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. -bye. bye.